Hi everybody and welcome to Chem Talk, where today we'll be thinking about atomic structure, specifically looking at electrons and orbitals. Before getting into really deep into chemistry, it is important to understand what we're working with. The basic unit of life is the atom. Within the atom, there is the nucleus, which contains the protons and the neutrons of the atom. Protons are positively charged particles that are relatively large in mass, and they're located inside the nucleus. Neutrons, as the name implies, are neutral particles, which are about the same in mass as a proton, um, slightly less, and are also located inside the nucleus. The electrons, however, revolve around the nucleus and located outside the nucleus with a negative charge with a very, very small mass. The atomic number of an element indicates the number of protons inside the nucleus of that element. For a neutral atom, they will, it will have the same number of electrons. With this foundation, we can begin to go further in depth about the atomic structure of an atom, specifically looking at the behavior of electrons around the nucleus. When looking at bonds between atoms, such as oxygen and hydrogen, it is there is often a sharing of electrons, but in reality, there is something much deeper going on. This idea uses an area of science called quantum mechanics. This deals with the behavior of electrons in atoms and molecules, and we will conceptually explore this here. First, let's try to understand if an electron is a wave. Well, first let's think about light, which we know is a wave. When light passes through, say, your window, for example, you can see the whole rainbow on your carpet or your floor. Well, an electron behaves the same way. It diffracts light, which means it has the characteristic of a wave, not a particle. But the electron has a charge and mass, meaning it does have the properties of a particle. Well, this brings into the idea of the wave-particle duality, where the electron behaves both as a wave and a particle. Now, why does this matter? Well, normally the position of any object can be seen and known very precisely. Take a pencil, for example. When it is sitting on a desk, you can say with utmost confidence where it is and that it is not moving, that its velocity is zero. You could say this about a lot of things, chemistry textbooks, people, even molecules. Maybe the electron? Actually, no. The problem is that textbooks, people, and even molecules are of a certain size and scale but electrons and other teeny tiny particles are of a much smaller size, so then the exact position of them, such as the electron, is a bit hazy, so we are limited to knowing the probability that the electron is in a certain region of space. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which, just as we said, tells us that the accuracy with which we can determine the position and velocity of a particle is inherently limited. We can only know the probability that the electron will be in this position in a certain region of space. With this new understanding, we can now go back to trying to understand atomic structure. Simpler and earlier models show the electron revolving around the nucleus just as the Earth orbits the Sun. However, with our increased understanding of the electron and knowing that we cannot exactly know where it resides, we must modify this model slightly. We replace the idea of the orbit with the orbital, which describes the wave properties of an electron in an atom. An atomic orbital is almost like an allowed state, an allowed wave motion of an electron. And just as an electron can only exist in certain states or orbitals, it can only have certain allowed energies. Each orbital is associated with a characteristic electron energy. So in hydrogen, for example, with its one electron, the electron resides in the lowest most orbital, or n equals one, and its principal energy is known. and remains there unless it is subjected to an exact amount of energy to allow it to move to n equals 2. If that happens, the electron absorbs enough energy and instantaneously is a new, more energetic wave motion that is now associated with the next energy level, which is n equals 2. But in order for this to happen, the electron must have gained this exact amount of energy between the energy levels. For example, if we look at if someone is pushing a ball up a hill. In this case, the ball is the electron and hill is the, is like the height difference between the two energy levels, for example. If you give a ball if you give a ball a little push, it'll roll up, but then it'll roll back down. If you give up the ball just enough energy that it can go all the way up the hill to that plateau, then it that's the only way it'll get all the way up there. It needs that exact amount of energy. And it's the same with the electron. Now, this has all been really abstract, but with this basic understanding, we can start to try visualizing the atomic structure we are talking about. One of the most important aspects of atomic structure for organic chemistry is that each orbital is characterized by a three-dimensional region of space in which the electron is most likely to exist, like we discussed earlier. This brings in the new model of the atom, known as Schrodinger's model, 
Schwartz utilizes Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Conceptually thinking, there is an attraction between the electron outside the nucleus and the protons inside the nucleus, but that is not the only factor at play when it determining the where the electron is. Both the, the distance between the electron and the nucleus, the surface area around the nucleus where the electron could be, and the volume of the density cloud of the, of the electron affects the, the 90% probable location of the electron. This involves a lot of thorough calculations involving looking at the wave and probability functions of the electron, but it basically boils down to the idea of distance, surface area, and volume. Two visualizations of orbitals can be seen here, with the s orbital on the left and the p orbital on the right. Here the 1s orbital is shown. If we were to think of the 2s orbital, that would be an outer spherical layer outside that 1s orbital. As the energy level increases, so does the distance between the electron cloud and the nucleus, which is why the 2s orbital is further away from the nucleus than the 1s orbital. There is also lies an empty space between the 1s orbital and the 2s orbital. This region is called a node. A node is a region of zero electron probability. Now, why does this happen? Well, as we discussed before, the electron must obtain a lot of energy to jump to the next energy level. It is an all or nothing scenario. It cannot reside in between energy levels. It is either in the 1s or the 2s orbital, but not in between. So there must be, so there lies a region in between where there is zero electron probability. The p orbitals are visualized on the right, and they have three orientations for, based on the three states for p orbitals. Here, the y-axis orientation is shown, but there are two other orientations, which can be on the z-axis or on the x-axis. Overall, inside every atom, there is a nucleus, which contains the protons and neutrons of the atom. The nucleus is surrounded by electrons. As we talked about, electrons are both a wave and a particle. They have wave-particle duality, and because of this, we cannot know the exact location of the electron we can only know a 90% probability that it'll be in a certain region of space. With this knowledge, we can now visualize atomic structure using orbitals, which have specific energies corresponding to the region of space they represent, where the 90, there's a 90% probability that the electron will be there. That's all for today. Thank you for tuning into ChemTalk, and please visit our website at www.chemistrytalk.org for more general organic and biochemistry videos.